making that change. So I want to let everybody know um, that we worked really hard for Will in 2022. We made lots and lots of calls. We watched all of his videos and loved all of his videos. And we've made even more calls this year. So this year, we've made 15,000 phone calls for Will. We have sent 200,000 texts for Will. And we have sent 100,000 postcards for Will. And we're making this whole week so a Will Rollins <laughs> week of action, getting out the phone on the, I mean, getting out the boats on the phone. So with that, without further ado, and Linda's here too, Will, I want to turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Molly. And thank you, Linda. And thank you, Commit to Democracy, which is my favorite named group of all time, I think, uh, going all the way back to 2022. And I'm sorry that I was late. I was literally talking to an undecided voter uh, before I jumped on to this call. Uh, and that's a big part of what I've been doing in the in the last seven days is calling undecided voters mm -hmm. in this district and uh, convincing them to, to vote, uh, number one, and then hopefully convincing them to vote for me. So I'll share a little bit of a campaign update and kind of where we're at in this district and why the calls that you all are helping us make are so absolutely critical in this last six days now. I can't believe it's less than one, uh, one week, but that's how close we are to November 5th. And um, before I do that, I know a lot of you have heard me share this before, and I'm, I won't I won't give the long version of my why, but just to expand a little bit on my background first and then talk about the three issues that I think are resonating most with voters in the district when we're knocking doors and, and uh, making those phone calls. So as Molly mentioned, I was a federal prosecutor, had wanted to work in national security since I was a kid. Um, when I saw the North Tower collapse on 9-11, thought about enlisting in the U.S. military, but uh, I was closeted. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was still in place, but I didn't want to give up on doing something in counterterrorism. So I made it to college, took Arabic, applied to the CIA, wow. uh, stuck at Arabic and never heard back from the CIA. So that was not going to be my, my path into service, but eventually made it to law school, clerked for a federal judge who said, if you're interested in national security, uh, you should become a federal prosecutor. So I took her advice, applied got hired to be an assistant U.S. attorney in the Central District of California and was lucky enough to specialize in counterterrorism and counterintelligence cases. Um, and I really loved that job. Got to work with the FBI, dealing with threats from all over the world, uh, Russia, China, Iran, ISIS, Al-Qaeda. Uh, but I was hired in 2016. And if you worked in law enforcement after that election, you started to see a huge rise in the threats from domestic terrorism culminating in many ways with January 6th. And January 6th is ultimately what got me into politics because I will never forget where I was when we started getting calls from our colleagues in the FBI and in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C., telling us that two dozen people had boarded commercial flights, returned to Southern California after attacking the U.S. Capitol, and they needed our help to track them down. And uh, I'm running against a guy who while we were doing that in law enforcement, was voting to decertify the election, voting against the January 6th committee, and then called for dropping charges even after it was clear that 140 cops had been injured with five later dying as a result of that attack. So he pissed me off. Uh, I feel like the people who enabled the attack on the U.S. Capitol do not deserve to work inside that building. And I quit my job and uh, ran against him in 2022 we gave him the closest midterm that he's had in three decades. And that's thanks to a lot of the people who are on this call who made that happen. We probably could have flipped the seat with a little bit more uh, resources from the, the national party in that midterm cycle. But the good news is they, they are not making that mistake the second time around. We've had enormous support from the DCCC, from House leadership, from everybody from Hakeem Jeffries to Pete Aguilar to Whip Clark to Speaker Pelosi to the governor. I mean, it's been incredible this second cycle, and uh, we are gonna finish the job in six days. And it's looking very good right now in our district, right? The polling shows this race as deadlocked, but we have the highest Democratic voter enthusiasm of any competitive seat in California. We also have a pretty good advantage right now in the early ballot returns. But the reason that phone banks like this one are so critical uh, is because we still have 30,000 Democrats in this district who skipped 2022, but who have voted in one election since 2016. So I'll say that again, 30,000 Democrats missed the midterms, but are semi-frequent voters. They voted in one election since 2016. So that means we call them low propensity Democrats. They, uh, they, they hang out on the couch and they don't always get off the couch. So we need your help 
getting them off the couch uh, in the next six days. Because if they had shown up in the midterms, I would have beaten Ken Calvert by 20,000 votes. And if we can convince them to show up in 2024, we are absolutely going to flip this seat. And I'll tell you about the three issues that are resonating most with those low propensity or undecided uh, Democrats, independents, and even some moderate Republicans who I've spoken to recently. So number one, uh, cost of living. I've been talking a lot about how we reduce the price of housing in the Inland Empire. We've got studio apartments that are going in Corona now for 2,500 bucks a month. We've got all time record highs for single family home prices. I wanna try to bring 3 million new housing projects to uh, Riverside County, not just at the national level. I know the vice president's been talking about uh, 3 million new units nationally. We really need 3 million units just in California. And so I'm going to push hard for more infrastructure dollars for the Inland Empire and the Coachella Valley, because that's going to expand the supply of housing and help reduce the cost. I support that first time tax credit for home buyers in the Inland Empire. I also support taking on some of the corporate investors who have snatched up a lot of real estate during the pandemic in Riverside County, and now have just held on to that, driving up some of the prices on people who are trying to get into the market for the first time. And of course, there's a lot of really young families in cities like Corona who are struggling just with childcare costs, which is why I'm also a big fan of the $6,000 $6, child tax credit uh, that's been proposed at the top of the ticket. And I'm, I'm going to vote for that one when I get to Congress as well. Um, we also want to expand the number of drugs that Medicare can negotiate directly with those pharmaceutical companies for. Uh, and I've got an opponent who voted against, of course, all of that legislation designed to reduce your medical costs at the end of each year, capping the cost of insulin at $35 a month, capping the out-of-pocket cost of prescription drugs at $2,000 a year. My opponent opposed both of those things, also voted against the largest bipartisan infrastructure bill in a generation, a bill that's bringing $300 million to Riverside County and creating six-figure incomes in a county where the median is $70,000 per household. So the cost contrast in this race is huge, as is the contrast on choice. Uh, I'm running against somebody who voted for a national abortion ban with no exceptions, voted against access to contraception, uh, access to birth control and condoms. And I'm been, I've been out there talking about passing the Women's Health Protection Act so we restore Roe versus Wade as the law of the land in this country. And that has been a huge mover for independent and even a lot of Republican women in this district who do not want the government telling a woman that she does not have a right to her own body. Um, and then the last contrast that I'd, I'd emphasize for folks who are dialing today is on corruption. Um, and this is if you get a moderate Republican or you get an independent and they're wondering who to vote for. They're not sure. They they maybe don't trust Democrats on all issues and they're, they don't trust the Republicans either. Let them know that their member of Congress has been ranked one of the most corrupt in the entire House of Representatives by nonpartisan watchdogs. Um, Fox News did a seven minute documentary talking about Ken Calvert's use of earmarks to benefit his personal real estate investments and his own Republican colleagues tried to keep him off the Appropriations Committee because they were worried about ethical issues. So voters in this district need to know that. Um, and they need to know where I stand on corruption. I want to pass a ban on stock trading by members of Congress. I want to pass a lifetime ban on lobbying by members of Congress. And I want to end Citizens United so we finally get dark money out of our political system. So those are the three C's that we always share with folks when they're knocking doors and making calls for us. Mm -hmm. Costs, choice, corruption. And I just want to say again how grateful I am to everybody for jumping on and giving us a little bit of your of your Wednesday uh, today with six days to go. Because as I said, those 30,000 Democrats, and that's primarily going to be the folks who are on your call sheets today, low propensity Democrats, um, those are the folks who are going to make the difference in this election. And I'll, I'll, I'll end with one last thought, which is, you know, a lot of people in California assume that their vote doesn't matter. And I've knocked on doors and talked to voters in this past weekend who didn't realize that their vote could be the difference between whether the Democrats or the Republicans control the United States Congress. And there is nothing more powerful than reminding voters of how much their voice matters right now in this election, because <laughs> they have the ability to make sure that Hakeem Jeffries becomes the next speaker of the US House of Representatives. And when you tell voters that, they feel empowered, they feel inspired, 
and they show up. So thank you guys for being a part of this team from the beginning. Thank you for taking the time to dial for us. And uh, let's let's get out there and win this election and make sure we flip this seat on November 5th. Thank you so much, Will. That was so inspiring. We are so grateful for your time today.